may I invite Dr. Rasika Bula Singh, our secretary, uh, to introduce uh, today's speaker. Thank you, Dr. Nalakar. Welcome to a CME lecture series organized by Purunayagala Medical Association. Today's uh, topic is uh, is very much related to surgical field, but it is relevant to all of us. And uh, it is uh, surgical services in pandemic. Let me introduce uh, today's speaker. It's an honor for me to introduce him. He's one of my teacher, Professor Sivasurya Surya Sivaganesh. He's a consultant surgeon attached to Professorial Surgical Unit, uh, Colombo University. Professor Siva Surya Sivaganesh obtained, uh, graduated from uh, Colombo Medical Faculty and uh, obtained his uh, MD, MA surgery from uh, University of Colombo. And uh, he's a researcher. He has a lot of local and international publications under his name. Uh, without uh, further ado, I would invite Professor Sivanganesh to deliver his lecture. So it's over to you. Thank you, Rasika, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, thank uh, the Kurnagala Medical Association for your kind invitation to talk to you today. Um, when uh, my colleague Rasika asked me to give a talk, I, you know, unwittingly said yes. I can't refuse Rasika. Uh, when and when I realized the talk was going to be surgical services or something related to COVID-19 and surgery, uh, I must say I was and I was uh, is uh, you know something that I am. Uh, specialized in or probably qualified to talk on. Uh, but let me see what I, I've gathered a few thoughts and put a few slides together. Uh, and I hope I will do justice to your invitation. So once again, thank you for uh, calling me. So uh, over the next uh, half an hour or so, uh, I thought I'd talk about some of these aspects of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and surgery. Of course, importantly, how has it impacted health systems and uh, surgical services? Uh, we To look at our national response to the surgical services, uh, how it has impacted surgical morbidity and mortality, the pandemic, uh, and uh, some of the recommendations that are out there in relation to surgery during the pandemic. And I think uh, most importantly, probably at the end, uh, some of my reflections and what I think are lessons for the future going forward uh, from my experiences in this pandemic. So I think it may be more appropriate for me to actually say these are really the perspectives of a surgeon uh, in relation to working in this pandemic. And uh, I must qualify that by saying that uh, I'm sure there are many more surgeons who work uh, in these uh, hospitals uh, who have particularly taken in patients uh, who've been working much more than I have uh, in managing surgical uh, uh, or COVID-19 positive surgical patients. So it's with that qualification that I will proceed. So the pandemic has actually hit global healthcare systems uh, in a fairly significant way. It's not just our country. It's not just the developing world. In fact, in some instances, it has probably impacted the so-called healthcare systems of the developed world, developed world more so than the developing nation. Uh, there is a paradoxically a sort of a theory behind this. When systems have been over efficient sometimes, and they lack the ability uh, or sometimes the flexibility to rapidly mobilize resources, especially when large populations are affected. We know that in the West, they are very efficient in terms of cost, supply, and so on in most instances. For instance, when they have this, what is called the just in time supply chain, where whether it's equipment or drugs, they come in right at the moment, and there isn't much in terms of reserve stock. Uh, when a pandemic like this hits, uh, these economic calculations get thrown aside and 
there are supply deficiency. So it has been a pandemic that has affected uh, the first, second and third world or higher, lower and middle income countries alike. And sometimes more so in the developed nations because expectations also are very high there. In addition, if you look at global health trends, uh, the pandemic came right in the middle uh, of a period where current trends in healthcare systems are to address non-communicable diseases like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And this is related to uh, lifestyle changes in populations and especially an aging population. So here in the middle of this emphasis of non-communicable diseases comes an infectious disease which causes a significant amount of morbidity, mortality and disruption to health systems. So healthcare systems were not prepared. And like I said at the start, uh, and this is more so of the developed world, when healthcare systems are driven to be very efficient, so efficiency driven shift of care, where uh, more and more patients are moved from inpatient to outpatient settings, uh, resulting in reduction in inpatient beds, which are actually very costly, uh, that resulted in a lack of reserve capacity when large number of patients required hospitalization. Then you also have this uh, concept of uh, vulnerable populations and especially, for instance, in oncology, finances and resources are disproportionately spent in these cases. So oncology plays a big part in it. And there is this thing called orphan drugs, drugs on which there isn't, or with, in which large uh, volumes are not made, but they are for rare diseases. Uh, a lot of investment goes into that, uh, resulting in sometimes basic healthcare needs not being met. And there is less and less investment in preventive care and more and more investment in therapeutic care and tertiary care as we ourselves see uh, you know, this trend sometimes in our country as well. So COVID-19 came and basically through the whole system into a sort of, it was going on probably the fifth year and suddenly we, were, we had to shift down to about the first year. So it threw all health systems out of that. So if you look at the reaction to this whole thing, uh, and I'm sure all of us, all of you would have also passed through various phases of this starting on one end or the other, and we probably ended up somewhere in between. Uh, our reaction, especially in the early stages to this pandemic, was quite variable. Uh, there was one, if you took two extremes, there was one extreme of those who were very indifferent uh, to the pandemic, you know. And, and I, uh, I must confess, even I thought that the you know, onset is just another viral flu, which is virulent. Why is everybody making such a big fuss about it? It's an all and a very exaggerated response. And you know, there were the conversations, you know, so many people are dying from road traffic accidents every day. Uh, there are many cancer patients and everybody is talking about this one viral infection. It must be a conspiracy, can't be so and so on. You had that group. Then in the other end of the spectrum, you had those who moved into extreme paranoia about COVID-19. Uh, they were extremely fearful. They were watching newscasts from other countries, seeing uh, these reports of uh, patients falling ill, dying. Uh, and that group of patients, uh, of, of healthcare personnel, wanted to shut down all systems. They wanted to isolate themselves. Uh, so you had these very extremes of people. And of course, you had people in between. But I think over a period of time, now that we've been through this pandemic for more than a year and a half, uh, I think most of us have fallen uh, somewhere in between in a sort of what we may call a pragmatic middle ground uh, in our reaction to COVID-19 spectrum, uh, in reaction to the uh, pandemic. Uh, and this is important to realize because these reactions also govern our actions and our policies 
regard with regards to the health system, whether it is surgical or otherwise. So this is how things started off. Now, when this pandemic struck, and when we in Sri Lanka started realizing that this was something that we needed to act on, uh, the adaptation of health and surgical services, health in general and surgical services in particular, uh, took varying forms. So it started sometimes at individual unit level. But I think the most important response, at least in the early stages, before national responses came into place, before we started receiving ministerial direct, uh, directives, recommendations, and circulars from the Ministry of Health and the COVID task force, it was individual institutions that really gelled together and started taking action. So I can speak for the national hospital and I'm talking about the surgical services, where the National Hospital was concerned, uh, it was the surgeons uh, and anesthetists and other clinicians with their input who really uh, started off making decisions, writing or do, taking decisions with regards to surgery, admissions, policies, and so on. So it was the institutional response, and I'm sure the same applies to other hospitals, including Purnagala, it was the specialists and the other doctors in the relevant hospitals along with the who really got the initial response going. Yes, later the Ministry of Health came into place. Subsequently, the College of Surgeons and other specialty colleges, depending on the uh, subspecialty involved, were also part and parcel of this. But institutions play a large part. And this is important for us to appreciate and realize uh, because institutions are probably the best equipped to deal with these things in the acute phase. And for that to be efficient, uh, institutional cohesion, and when I say institutional cohesion, I mean specialists, administrators, and other healthcare workers being able to work together in institution is important. Subsequently, the ministry obviously uh, started, you know, it's a, it's a large juggernaut. It takes time for it to start moving and doing things. But I must say with time that they got their act going. And of course, then we have the global response for which the WHO also plays a large role uh, and international players. So these are the players who really got going. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a few things about how we as an institution at NHS respond to this pandemic. Uh, I'm sure you all all had very similar experiences, but I just thought I'll share a few things. So uh, if I'm right, we closed for international travel around uh, mid-March, around the 18th of March. Um, we were all talking about this in the lounge. I can remember we saying, you know, what do we do? But on the 20th of March, we decided that we needed to do something. There was an emergency meeting, uh, primarily of the surgeons and anesthetists. And at that meeting, we uh, discussed uh, and came up with a few documents uh, and proposals for inpatient care, management of staff and theaters uh, at the National Hospital for Surgeons. Uh, we subsequently had several other meetings. I won't go into all the details as the uh, pandemic evolved. Uh, as we learned more, uh, for instance, a week later, we, were, were, we went on to uh, have some recommendations on outpatient care. And I'll just very briefly show you some of the things we did. Uh, and this was from our initial uh, recommendations that we work on a weekly rota basis, uh, reduce as uh, Mind you, at this time, we knew very little about COVID-19 infection. We, uh, our cells were not very sure as to what was going on, how this infection spread and so on. Uh, so we worked on surgical teams and anesthetic teams working on a rota. Uh, we set aside a few wards for patients with suspected COVID-19 infections, surgical patients. 
uh, for those of you who know the NHSL, we, we kept the pre squads as reserves. Uh, we put in a plan to combine surgical wards uh, and share patients, uh, share beds. Uh, if the requirement arose, we didn't do it at that time. Uh, and then we also uh, decided to scale down on surgery uh, to restrict it to only urgent and emergency procedures. So those were some of the initial we cut down our theater sessions to one per day and eight to two p.m. using only the main table, and these are some of the uh, sort of uh, specific plans uh, of theaters that we were going to use. We closed down the two main theaters. Uh, one of the reasons we closed down those two theaters is we didn't know what sort of uh, ventilatory capacity was required for the hospital, uh, and we were going to potentially use the ventilators in the anesthetic machines in theater as ventilators if the need arose. So uh, these are all early days adjusting to uh, this new pandemic about which we knew very little actually at that time. Uh, moving on, uh, we also made some recommendations for outpatient care. I won't trouble you with these. Uh, basically, to streamline clinics, minimize patient attendance, uh, facilitate patients getting their drugs from the OPD. Uh, some of this did not occur, did not take place. Uh, sometimes uh, patients also didn't turn up after a while. Uh, but uh, I'm and I'm sure you're all you all aware. Of the good thing came out of this was the Ministry of Health uh, in conjunction with the institution for the hospitals. Uh, started mailing drugs to patients, and that uh, greatly helped cover this period um, for outpatient uh, attendance. Uh, this was the other document that we made on the 20th, based on information that was available to us globally uh, in, in, in online. Uh, this was the these were the precautions we put in place for theater. So. I think if you really look at this, uh, they are just an enhancement of standard infection control and safe practice in theater. It's just that we've started putting it in, uh, of course, with the addition of using personal protective uh, equipment. Uh, but a lot of them were sort of common sense uh, procedure. Um, and uh, these were done, printed, uh, laminated, put on all, kept in all the theaters, kept in all three languages so that all levels of staff could read, understand, and know uh, what was going on, and that there was a standard followed by uh, everyone. Uh, and this was done uh, in conjunction with our colleagues, uh, the anesthetists, uh, and this was the this was basically up and running uh, from about uh, the third week of March. So. Theatre precaution. Uh, we also devised uh, a screening tool for patients who were admitted. Uh, I'm, again, you would have uh, seen uh, these. Subsequently, we got these from the Ministry of Health. But this is where I say again, even before we got uh, any such uh, input from either the professional colleges or the Ministry of Health, at the level of the hospital, we had started doing all this. So we had forms to screen patients for COVID-19. Over a period of time, these evolved. There were changes as the disease pattern changed and the patient numbers and the variants changed. But these were the early forms in March that we put in and uh, screened our patients when they came in for COVID-19. So we didn't we reinvent the wheel. So we use lot of guidelines that at that time came out from both the Royal College of Surgeons of the UK and the Association of Upper Gastrointestinal Surgeons of the UK, uh, and from the American College of Surgeons. So we didn't have much to go by. To be very frank, I don't think even they had much to go by. But these were the guidelines that came up on the best evidence available. At that time, mind you, this was early March. We were probably just 
two months into the pandemic and very little or not much if i may say was known then about uh, how things were going to pan out and about the spread of the virus and uh, so on so using this we then made certain general principles about surgery some of these are still uh, applicable uh, or a large amount of these are still applicable so uh, basically how to screen patients if they come in for emergency surgery um, urgent planned surgery uh, for instance where possible we we were encouraged to do stomas rather than formal anastomosis um also the use of ppe pragmatic use of ppe right but could then could not be used um we had to also keep in mind when operating uh, even on semi urgent urgent patients uh, to minimize the possible requirement of post operative complications which may require icu yeah, because at that time we were also pressed for beds uh, or we, we we didn't know what the potential numbers were going to be for icu so we had to keep as many i reserve icu beds as possible so uh, in some instances where originally somebody may have had a stroke uh, anastomosis we we even recommended going for stroma and these are some of the specific conditions uh, just to emphasize wherever possible manage non operatively uh, or via alternative measures whether it is uh, perianal problems a uh, uh, lot of soft tissue in which uh, sometimes may have typically been managed with uh, uh, general anesthesia and so on we did wide bow aspirations uh, or ints and the local same with the uh, other things of course in certain instances one does not did not have a choice if it was a perforation bowel ischemia obstruction they needed to be operated okay um and uh, many patients with uh, appendicitis uh, actually ended up with uh, antibiotics they they fared very well um, and went home so we managed almost all whatever possible acute appendicitis uh, medically uh, subsequently we got some of them back and uh, did it for an appendectomy um so these were guidelines obviously the final say as to how to manage uh, the patients was taken by the surgeons concerned because they ultimately bear responsibility for that patient but these guidelines helped us all uh, to focus on how we uh, got through this period with minimal problem biliary pathologies uh, wherever possible we want to minimize uh, cholecystectomy delay cholecystectomy uh, put stents in place of that uh, for acute cholecystitis for instance there was a failure to improve uh, go for percutaneous cholecystectomy uh, the the important thing that i think in hindsight and if you really look at this we realize is many of the things recommended here uh, actually with our things that are accepted also accepted as standard practice and can be utilized even in non pandemic times i will touch on some of those as we go further down uh, one of the problems we of the concerns at that early in these early stages was laparoscopy uh, we didn't know what the dangers of laparoscopy were in terms of infections to the healthcare workers and Uh, at that time uh, the initial recommendations that actually came out uh, were to avoid laparoscopy wherever possible uh, and that's exactly what we did so some of the patients who may have had laparoscopic procedures ended up having open procedures uh, with time of course there was better information about this and now uh, with adequate safe precautions laparoscopy is not a problem even in covid-19 uh, endoscopy still remained the high risk procedure though it was done uh, only in very urgent and more emergency procedures especially uh, upper gastrointestinal endoscopy uh, and with adequate protection so 
when devising these guidelines, and this, this is also important, when we devise guidelines, we need to be uh, cognizant about why we make these guidelines, what are the objectives behind these guidelines. Uh, otherwise, we may stray or we, we may not be very focused on what we're doing. So these were the, the objectives of the guideline. And one and very important is to protect the surgical workforce. Because if you have your workforce ill, uh, then, then you're in a disastrous situation. So protecting the surgical workforce was a very important consideration. And that included the surgeons, nurses, orderlies, everyone. Uh, so that played a very important part uh, in when, when we make these guidelines. The other important thing is, under all circumstances, we had to maintain emergency surgery, both the capability and the capacity. And by capability, it's having theaters, staff, capacity, consumables, oxygen, and so on. So under no circumstances should we be using this capability and capacity for non-urgent, elective, delayable procedures at the expense of emergency surgery. So we were very, or we needed to be very cognizant of that. Uh, and when we talk of elective surgery, to have some sort of system to prioritize. So prioritizing uh, urgent elective surgery. Uh, and to do this, we, the best way to do this is by consensus. So, surgical teams working together, um, using some sort of rationale. Uh, any level, uh, you, you decide. Because uh, if individuals are allowed to do this by themselves, uh, then obviously there are biases, competing interests coming. Uh, and it's best to try as best, much as possible to work together as surgical teams and do this. Uh, and I think it would be fair to say that to a large extent, at least in our institution, uh, this worked. The other is, though we were looking at the surgical aspect of all uh, this, it was very important that we also thought about preserving capacity to support the health service COVID-19 response and ensure that all these patients receive optimal care. And in a way, and I will briefly touch on this later, uh, COVID-19 or the pandemic actually, I think brought this realization, I can speak for surgeon, uh, that we need to more work more with other clinicians, infection control, hospital administration, policy makers, uh, because all patients are patients. So we needed to make sure that while we maintain our emergency surgical capability and capacity, we also took into account the bigger patient pool in the, on the medical and the other specialities, whether it was uh, for COVID or non-COVID. So the, the end of the day, these guidelines are there to make sure patients would be optimal and uh, safe. Now, why did we have to go down this road? Uh, why is it important for us to know? Uh, because the evidence is now out there. There is more and more evidence coming out about what COVID-19 does to surgical patients. Uh, because this is important for us in terms of timing of surgery. Um, and uh, also uh, being aware of the potential problems. Now, this is a paper that came actually last year from the Lancet. Uh, and what it shows is that, and it's in one in four almost, so you're looking at 23.8% uh, have a 30-day uh, mortality of almost 20 or one in four patients uh, after surgery. These are for patients who either had, who had confirmed COVID-19 infection a week or within 30 days of surgery. And that's a big number of one in four. Uh, and what they found is that when they had COVID-19 infections detected post-operatively, the infection rates were actually, or the mortality rates were actually high, about 
20.4 versus 9.1. And as we all know, it's primarily pulmonary complications that cause a problem. Most of in pulmonary complications are seen in more than half the patients. And they were the cause of death in the vast majority. So as you can see, more than 80% of them died of pulmonary complications. This is a very, very important consideration when we take up patients for surgery, and this is true even currently, it's, it's contextual. And these are the risk factors. So male sex, yes, but especially elderly patients, those with poor ASA status, ASA three, you are going to start going into three and four, emergency surgery, major surgery, and surgery for malignancy. These are the high risk groups for a high 30-day mortality after COVID-19 infection. So we need to keep this in mind. And based on these uh, current recommendations in terms of elective surgery after COVID-19 infection uh, of the American Society of Anesthesiology, their recommendations are these, that if you have a patient who is asymptomatic, right, or it's got only mild respiratory symptoms, it's still preferable to wait at least four weeks after recovery from infection. And they take the recovery from infection is variable, but it's about 10 days after all symptoms have ceased. So even now, we've got to be cautious because there is a small group of patients, especially among this high risk group, who look potentially well, or who may be potentially well, but can have subclinical pulmonary problems. And uh, mortality after surgery. Now, the period that they recommend goes up based on certain other factors. So six weeks if they've been symptomatic, they've got respiratory tract symptoms, but did not require hospitalization. The number goes up further if they have been hospitalized, so it's about eight to 10 weeks. And if, or if they have an immuno, uh, immunocompromised system, especially diabetes. So eight to 10 weeks. And if you've been in an ICU due to COVID-19, you've got severe infection. Uh, the recommendation is that you wait at least 12 weeks for major surgery. Uh, so one has to be cautious and not complacent even now because uh, you, and we have seen a few cases like this at NHSL and globally, uh, where patients have developed post-operative COVID uh, pulmonary complications, and there has been both mortality uh, and significant ICU stay in some of these patients. Uh, so it's something that we've got to be uh, careful about when planning elective surgery. Obviously, if it's emergency surgery, then uh, one doesn't have a choice. In this uh, I think it's still important to pay attention uh, on minimizing preoperative COVID-19 risk. Uh, these are things you would probably tell your patients, especially patients who are waiting surgery, elective, non-emergency. Make sure they are vaccinated and that they are at least 14 to 21 days post-vaccination. Wherever possible, well, now with the current, uh, at least on paper, the lockdown, this is possible, but limit social contacts, uh, at least for a brief period before planned surgery. Uh, get them to... Uh, Wear masks, so practice respiratory hygiene, uh, do respiratory exercises, deep breathing, incentive spirometry, right? Uh, those won't minimize the preoperative COVID 19 risk per se, but will improve their respiratory capacity. And where relevant, hospital screening, right? Uh, who will you screen more particularly? Uh, those who have contacts, symptoms. Uh, and a compilation of rat PCR and where relevant, uh, if, depending on the institution and the country, uh, high resolution uh, HRCD. Right, so these are some ways of minimizing preoperative or making sure you screen for preoperative COVID. Okay, so we were happily going along uh, somewhere around June, July. May, June, July this year, we thought, you know, things are now settled. We've, we've gone beyond 
all these problems. Surgery was starting to pick up and so on. And then we were hit by the Delta wave. Uh, as we all, you all, all of us were. Uh, and this is something that went around the country, spike in the community. We had a massive influx of patients into NHSL. We couldn't transfer anyone out to the so-called COVID unit because they were overwhelmed themselves. Uh, and at one point, we had more than 700 COVID-19 positive patients and over 50% of these patients were oxygen dependent. Uh, in addition to that, like in all other institutions, there was a high attrition rate of all categories of healthcare. We were very short of staff, interns, doctors, registrars, consultants, nurses, orderlies, critical shortage of staff, shortage of ICU, maximum capacity in terms of oxygen use and other consumables. So this brought up a new challenge. Uh, and then we had to scale back again. We reduced our inpatient numbers drastically. We combined the wards. The original plan was in place, so that was quite easy to do because we had already decided how wards were going to be combined. Uh, and some uh, two to three units combined to form one ward. Uh, our inpatient rates dropped to something like at, at the peak, maybe five to 10% of our average uh, inpatient rate. Uh, we decided to continue only emergency and essential elective, including malignancies, uh, and reduce our theater list so to uh, either one or at most two lists per week. Now, there was a problem here, and that was something that we realized in due course. So, we still, our decision was to continue doing malignancies. Now, if you think about it, what we found then is when we got in our patients for surgery, Almost three or all four of them turned out to be positive. And the moment they became positive, they either had to be quarantined. The other problem was a lot, lot of these patients who have malignancies are also elderly. They are in their 60s, 70s. Uh, they have diabetes, other comorbidities. They may have been smokers. And in the early phases of the Delta, phase of the Delta Way, a significant number of them had either been not vaccinated or had only received one dose of vaccination. Now, we prioritize malignancies with the goal or with the objective of you, know, uh, you don't want to delay malignancy, especially some malignancy that you think or you're, you're worried about the upstage or advanced. But what started happening was patients were coming, these sorts, particularly high-risk patients were coming to our clinic, sitting in that clinic, getting COVID, or coming to the ward, waiting, catching COVID from somebody else. And then they, their mortality and morbidity from getting COVID-19 far outstripped their likelihood of deterioration to the malignant. So in, in essence, if you look at the bigger picture, delaying investigation and treatment of a malignancy for four to six weeks, the outcome or the change in outcomes were negligible compared to taking the risk of these unvaccinated or partially vaccinated patients into our clinics, hospitals, and operating. And this sort of realization actually struck us uh, during that period. And this was not done institutionally, but in some units. So at some point we decided, no, even malignancies, unless they had been fully vaccinated and had got, uh, and were at least two to three weeks post vaccination, we didn't even get them into the clinic. We didn't get them into the ward and we didn't operate on them. Because if you look at it, the chance, if you get a bad COVID infection and they got severe disease, uh, the chance of them becoming hypoxic, going into ICU and probably dying, far, far, far outweighed uh, a small delay in attending to the malignancy. And this was what uh, we did uh, additionally in this uh, wave as well. So you see this approach to elective surgery, the pandemic, what we realized over a period of time is it's not static, it's dynamic. Uh, it kept changing or it keeps changing as we know more about the demography, 
the the epidemiology uh, and the natural history of this disease it's very contextual it has to be tailored to our country no two countries are the same the healthcare institution the particular patient the disease the variant of the virus the vaccination status what resources are available uh, basically what i'm trying to say is there are no there is no one size fits all uh, in how we decide to proceed for elective surgery in this kind of a pandemic and that's not only for covid-19 that's true for anything that might occur in the future we need to keep in mind the safety of the surgical team and other healthcare workers the safety of our patients the surgical patient but not just them but all patients medical covid and so on and at every point we need to look at the benefits versus adverse outcomes it's a, it's a balance it's clinical medicine practically uh and if you look at it at an institutional level which is the center of functioning here also at a national level and this is those who do atls in trauma you know we use this term triage we want to do the best for the most with the kind of resources we have and that should be the approach even here now this is easy to say uh, in a practical sense there are a lot of hurdles uh, you know we are in essence playing god we are saying you know you can have this you can have this and so on. there are conflicting priorities among such as clinicians uh, whether we like it or not we are all very territorial uh, however educated than civilized we may be we become very territorial on various matters including uh, we call them our patients surgical patients care patients uh, you know so at the end of the day they are all uh, members of the community seeking health care for their respective problem so this territorial instinct can get in the way of rational uh, logical thought processes and we are very emotive about certain things when you say cancer patient people feel you know very emotive about it uh, decision making to come into an icu escalation of care in an icu when you have very limited resources uh, all these plain on our rational and logical approach and that is a fact of life so uh, but in our minds we need to have that objective of trying to do the best for the most so as surgeons we need to try and think beyond what we call our patients our surgical patients but it's not just that it's it's all people out there. um you all know this there it has impacted surgery in many ways pandemic uh, long awaiting times there have been patient delays hospital delays uh, we all know there have been periods of neglect uh, by acts of permission commission patient morbidity mortality to a certain extent has gone up there has been an immense strain on resource allocation and supplies education has been affected surgical undergraduate training post graduate education these have all been affected in various ways i won't spend too much time uh, the impact on surgery waiting time we don't have really any data from sri lanka we don't actually know what the impact in terms of morbidity and mortality has been uh, morbidity and mortality in our country hopefully in the future we'll have some of that uh, but this is another this is a study from i think sweden or somewhere in scandinavia where they showed that waiting times had gone up especially for uh, gastrointestinal and urological cancer by uh, anything ranging from 7 to 35% uh, may not really be the same here but to be very frank we don't know what the figures really are um this is a important problem for us medical students you know their appointments their examinations are postponed undergraduates have major financial implications because they have problems they have to stay accommodation delays in internship affect all of us surgical training has become a big problem there is a reduced case load there is reduced operative opportunity and experience rotations examination and even recruitment to the program have been affected so uh, that's another key aspect that we need to look at uh, to make sure we produce 
uh, competent surgeons and alternatives to them. So, um, was everything about COVID-19 bad? You know, they say, uh, there is a saying that every cloud has a silver lining. Uh, I think this says it in a probably a nice way. My apologies to the females in the audience. I don't know an equivalent, but um, I think it's important to get something positive out of even the most uh, negative experiences that uh, individually, institutionally, or nationally we may have. So, have there been some, has there been this so called silver lining? I think so. I think we, this pandemic has improved communication both within and between specialities. We, it has fostered some amount of cohesion and working together. As surgeons, and I, I can speak for myself, I can't speak for everyone, I think uh, we have begun to think a little beyond the narrow confines of our own speciality uh, and realize that we are part of a greater health system and that we need to work with and collaborate and cooperate with that greater health system for the improvement of our own speciality as well. Uh, it has led to a lot of innovation, uh, both you know, even in surgery, in practical terms, how we do things, uh, it has made us think. Uh, there's another thing, and that is, it, it has taught us to take a fresh look at how we practice in surgery. I'll just, I just have a slide beyond the. I'll talk a little more. Learn of uh, technology and Zoom. Uh, you don't have to travel so many things now. Access to conference webinars, conduct of multidisciplinary team meetings. Uh, it has in some senses brought the country closer together where we can communicate. Now I'm sitting in Palambo talking to you at Kurnangal, otherwise I'd have to uh, drive there. Not that I don't like, I, uh, I have very fond memories of Kurnangal and I would be glad, glad to come there anytime because I did my uh, peripheral surgical appointment in 2002 uh, in Kurnangal. So I was there six months, so I have fond memories of that hospital. Um, all these uh, annual congresses and meetings, there are a lot of savings. We spend tremendous amounts of uh, money on uh, these uh, clinical meetings, conferences, and uh, we find that we can do the same thing with uh, very much less resources in terms of uh, even sponsorships and otherwise. So it's, it's all good. And I think we surgeons are quite guilty of not adopting adequate infection control measures. And this is a well-known fact in wards, you know, cleaning hands and so on. And COVID has somehow made us all be very clean, wash our hands, regularly use sanitizers and so on. So there have been positive outcomes from this pandemic. Uh, and hopefully these will uh, last as we go along. How has our response been, and I'm talking a little bit more in a broader sense, uh, these are my perspectives. As I said at the start, this is a surgeon's perspective on the, the pandemic. Um, I think for a country with the levels of spending in healthcare that we have, uh, for you to just put it in perspective, Sri Lanka spends something like 110 US dollars per capita on health. Compare that with say the US, which spends close to 10,000 US dollars on health, or Australia, which spends six and a half to 7,000, uh, similar rates in the UK, we spend just 110 US dollars per capita on health. So if you look at it in that perspective, actually, we haven't done too bad. I know there are a lot of things we can improve. Uh, our response has been relatively successful, uh, very commendable vaccination rate, and that, thankfully, it's due to our health infrastructure too. Uh, there have been a lot of leadership, uh, the health system, the military, all have worked together, but we've got good health infrastructure. Uh, and I can't un underestimate 
or overemphasize the importance of our national health service. The concept of free health and free education, which go together, uh, it has also contributed to obligation on the part of healthcare workers and others to help not only with volunteerism, donations, and so on, to get through this pandemic. For instance, this home care of COVID-19 patients, monitoring patients at home, has been tremendously successful. It has had a huge impact in helping to curb the Delta wave. Uh, with a large number of patients now being managed at home, it has taken the brunt of care uh, away from uh, our healthcare system. So I think we should not be too hard on ourselves about how we responded to it. I think considering the circumstances did not be too bad. So to sum up and finish, um, I think it's always important um, to reflect. We don't have, sometimes we don't have time to think and reflect on uh, the bigger picture. We are so caught up with the present. Uh, we are so uh, obsessed uh, with what's going to happen in the future that we don't sometimes look at things and you know, in, in hindsight and reflect on them. Uh, because it's not only reflection, you should reflect and make your voice heard because it's important uh, for making sure we don't make the same mistakes again and improve as we go forward. One thing that has happened is it's shown us, this pandemic has shown us the importance of preventive care. Simple things, lifestyle, and behavioral modification in disease control. Wearing a mask, wear relevant distancing, hygiene, sanitation, common sense measures, not crowding. We are in a society where everyone and everything requires a quick fix. We, are, we have WhatsApp, we have uh, SMS. Everyone wants a quick answer. Patients' expectations are that their problems can be sorted by a drug or surgery. And we also tend to uh, want to meet that expectation, a quick fix for everything. Uh, but therapy or treatment or management is beyond just a simple procedure or complex procedure uh, and medication. So a quick fix isn't always the answer. Investment in healthcare and education, again, I keep coming to this. There is a lot of debate in the country about whether our education system and our healthcare system deliver the you know, necessary uh, output in relation to what goes in. And very often you find that this is sometimes now measured in terms of rupees and cents. Is this amount of output there? Are they delivering this? I have no qualms about saying that, yes, our healthcare system and our education system needs to improve, it needs to evolve. Having said that, it requires investing. You cannot expect a public healthcare and education system to always deliver exact amounts that you can quantify and say this is what it is. It's an investment in the education and the welfare of the people of this country. And it's in times like this, when one is faced in a pandemic, when something critical occurs, that the effects of or the deficiencies in investment come out, the strains come out. You have to put excess in for what we call a rainy day at times of crisis, because at times of crisis, we cannot otherwise go. So it's very important. The importance of also investing in systems, infrastructure, and accountability. We can see how all these break down when the system is put into strain. And this is not just only in the healthcare system, but globally. Uh, we see that educated cognitive societies in general over the long term seem to fare better than personality-based society. Societies which put individuals up on a pedestal and uh, venerate them rather than uh, give importance to uh, systems. Uh, or societies that rely a lot on voodoo and ritual rather than science and logic. It doesn't have to be science, logic and rationale. Uh, and unfortunately, 
then we have five year election cycles uh, planning and policy are often uh, affected by these very short cycles so we've got to have professionals who can actually work and think and emphasize to the politicians that we need to work at least on certain baseline matters beyond these five year election cycles because that actually has a direct impact on healthcare uh, in this country as surgeons we need to reflect on our existing norms in surgical practice for instance the threshold for surgery we realized during the pandemic that, that, and maybe sometimes for some even before that that we do a lot of procedures that clearly do not actually require a large number of for instance if i may give you an example minor surgical procedures ganglia lipomas lumps and bumps and various things Uh, even hemorrhoids there are a lot of procedures that are done which are actually at the ex extremes of indication not really required not really resource uh, oriented not really uh, giving the required benefit that they do so they add to cost they add to time they add to crowding so we need to really relook and say does this person really need surgery do they need to come to even a surgical clinic so our thresholds for care in patient versus outpatient care we manage a lot of patients in an outpatient setting a good glaring example is for instance all patients with cellulitis end up in a ward many of them a vast majority of them can be managed as outpatients with oral antibiotics but they come in they have a full blood count they've got investigations they've got a cannula in they sit on a bed and they are given intravenous antibiotics so those are some things anesthesia we, we find that they are this has shown us that we can do procedures with more regional and local anesthesia rather than general anesthesia the use of antibiotics rather than intra excess of intravenous antibiotic use irrational intravenous antibiotic use where patients can uh, be managed i'm sorry that's not local on oral antibiotics and we have to be very cognizant about cost we don't see the cost in our public health system because it's not there on a bill to know how much it costs if today we are not cautious about how we spend in the public health yeah there is not going to be money for tomorrow's pandemic or tomorrow's crisis and who's going to suffer is going to be our future generation our kids and kids whoever who is down the line so i think the pandemic should make us stop and think about some of these things uh, in terms of our surgical practice um we need to work with everybody our other clinical colleagues our administrators uh, and so on it's, it's it's very important and that's something that needs to be done uh so thank you very much for your patience you think i'm sorry i don't know that i took more time than uh i was given uh but this um story is not over we've taken various bends up gone up come down uh, and we've still got more to learn with this pandemic but i think the key is as we go along to learn to work together to reflect uh to adapt and ultimately to be positive uh, and by positive i don't mean pcr positive but yeah uh, we have a positive outlook uh, thank you very much again to the kurnangala medical association for uh, uh, giving me this uh, opportunity to talk today uh, it was a pleasure thank you sir thank you for your uh, comprehensive lecture and yeah. uh, on behalf, on behalf of uh, kurunagala medical association uh, i thank you again for accepting our invitation and we expect uh, your support in future as well It thank you very much my pleasure thank you okay. thank you sir and uh, i would like to take this uh, opportunity to thank you all who came here and attend to this lecture and the people who joined us to zoom platform outside the kurunagala hospital and uh, our next 
next uh, CME session. The topic is uh, post COVID infection, which will be delivered by Dr. Duchanta Madhagedar, a consultant respiratory physician, teaching hospital uh, Kendi. Thank you. Have a nice evening.